Hi, I'm Giancarlo. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Felicia. Uh, there was something preceding this. Yeah. But let's get on. Uh, we're professionals here. <clears throat> this is our uh, review of... Five? Fief. Fief. <laughs> and his light is like blinking on and off. Which means what? Which means... Uh, means which, which means, means hopefully... we need to look at camera two now. Oh, camera two. With all the budget we have. Camera two, <laughs> there it is. Ooh, there's your camera too. Hi, I'm Joe Carlo. I'm Felicia. And this is our review of... <laughs> you know what? You start this one off and then I'll, I'll say it. Hi, I'm Felicia. Hi, and I'm Joe Carlo. And this is our review of... Fief, France, 1429. Fief has players controlling a noble family in France, 1429, as they'll make alliances, marry, manipulate, start wars, and do everything else they can to achieve their goal, total power. End the round with three victory points, or four when in an alliance, and you'll rule fief and win. When the board is placed, denoting the fiefs and bishoprics, each player will get a family board of their color, a random lord with matching stand, five deniers, a set number of tokens placed in their spot, and a player aid. Shuffle the remaining lord cards, forming a deck, and have both fortune and disaster cards shuffled together into another deck next to it. Fief and bishop paddles are placed in their respective spaces along the edge of the board. The remaining lord stands, dice, mills, strongholds, title tokens, and various others will be placed on the right side of the board in their space. Determine a first player, give him the first player card, and going in clockwise order starting with him, each player will choose a village to place his lord stand along with one stronghold, one knight, and three men at arms. You're ready to rule. This game has many, many detailed set of rules, and for the sake of brevity, we will touch on their more general information while giving you enough details to capture the feel of the game. A round is comprised of seven phases, each broken down into several other actions. The phases are taken in order. The first phase is Hear Ye, Hear Ye. Here players can announce marriages, which will create an alliance. To do so, a lord and a lady must be matched. They must not hold any ecclesiastical titles, and both players controlling those lords must agree. This is the only way to form an official alliance. Those players cannot attack each other. The only way to end a marriage is if one of the spouses dies, or the marriage gets annulled by a pope. If a king or a queen get married, the spouse will hold the other title respectively. In this phase, elections will be held as well, first starting with bishops, then pope, and finally king. Besides all candidates being male, other criteria must be in place before this happens. For bishop, all village of a bishop prick must be controlled by players. Bishop pricks are denoted by sequence color specific lines on the board. For pope, there must be two cardinals in play, and for king, at least three titled lords, which must include at least two bishops or one cardinal or the pope. These titles grant special privileges well listed on the player aid. These include tithing and tallage for money to excommunicate or stopping uprisings. What's important to note is that both the Pope and King will give the controlling player one VP each. Another thing to note is that the candidates do not need to be from that region in which that position is being voted for. Any Lord may apply, again depending on the title up for grabs, and vote power differ from player to player. Some will have more, others less depending on which villages they control, like principalities, titled Lords they have and other factors. When voting, players can place their vote tokens on the candidates, with white for yay or black for nay. Next phase is discard, draw, and play cards. First, the player can discard any cards they want. They draw two cards, either one lord and one fortune, or two fortunes. A player's hand limit is three. Should a disaster card be drawn, place it in the first available slot face down and continue until you get your cards. A fourth disaster would simply be discarded. When all players are done, we resolve the disaster starting with the first card. Flip it and announce its effects. There are three types, famine, heavy rain, or plague. Roll a die and the number will tell you which bishopric the disaster strikes by placing the card there. Sixes are considered false alarm and the disaster is discarded with no effect. Famines will have mills not produce income this round, heavy rains will hinder movement, and plague, well, kills people peasants and lords alike. When all disasters are resolved, players can choose to play cards. These include playing lords to increase your family and placing them on the board and giving a bishop a cardinal title for lord cards, 
to canceling disasters with good weather or harvest, to many other game effects with the fortune cards like assassination, taxing, insight and uprising, and many others. Third phase is income. Players collect one denier per village they control and two deniers per mill. Good weather and harvest will further increase mill generation of deniers by one respectively for that bishopric. The queen will collect two deniers here, and should a player have played a tax card, he takes all the mill's income from the bishopric he played it on. Also remember, any disaster card affecting this phase depending on where they are. Next phase is purchase. First, all captured lords will be ransomed, and the player who owns them must pay if they can. Of course, the more titled the lord is, the more expensive the ransom will be. Base cost is two deniers, plus two for each title the lord holds. Then players, always in turn order, can buy troops with costs listed on their family board, mills for 3 deniers, strongholds for 10, a cardinal beretta for 5, and a fief's title for a player who controls all the villages in that fief for 2 deniers per village there. That title can be given to a lord or lady, and when done, the player flips a stronghold counter to a fortified city side, making that village the fief capital. Phase 5 is movement. Lords may move two spaces with or without troops, unless a female, and only a female, has a dark title, in which case she can move three spaces. This title can be claimed through the Lord card should you have drawn it. Note that troops cannot move without a Lord or Lady. Careful when moving into bishoprics that have the plague, the newcomers won't be immune to it. When moving through an occupied space not belonging to you, you may ask permission to move through. If it is not given, you may return from where you came, stay there, or try and ride through should your troops be only knights. This is known as a cavalcade. It can be done only if the player still possesses one move left to move to the next area. Then, similarly, to a battle in the next phase. Dice will be rolled for casualties and or success. Here's how battle works. Should a space be contested by non-allied troops, a battle will ensue. A lord must be present at the location to initiate a battle, but not needed should the troops want to defend themselves. Each side total their strength points and roll a number of dice as indicated on the board. Men at arms provide one strength point, knights three, male and or titled lords one, and the female dark gains an extra die. Both players roll their dice and count the rolled icons or damage. Then opposing players assign the damage to their troops. Men at arms only take one damage to kill while knights take three. So if no men at arms are left and there remains two damage to allocate, the knights stay since there aren't enough wounds inflicted on it. Should there be no troops left on one side with a lord remaining when all damage has been assigned, it is captured. Place a stockade token on the card and it will be ransomed off next round. If all troops are gone from a side while a lord remains and there is at least one damage left to assign, the lord is killed. If troops remain on both sides, another battle round continues. A truce can be declared or a side can surrender but at a huge cost. They'll lose all their troops and the Lord will be captured. Strongholds will remove a die from the player attacking it, or two dice if it's a fortified city. But a player may opt to place it under siege after a battle resolves, which will have him place a siege engine token to offset a one die penalty. On a later round, he can flip the token to offset the two dice penalty should it be a fortified city. Of course, the attackers may be lucky and play a secret passage card to bypass the fortification penalties should he have it. Besieged locations do not provide income during the income phase. The defenders can attack the invading army, but will lose their fortification defense in doing so. Newly occupied locations may have the player opt to pillage the mills there, should he think he cannot hold that location, and he'll gain one denier for each. The last phase is victory conditions. Players check how many VPs they have. If not allied, a score of 3 will have you win the game. If allied through marriage, a score of 4 will have both those players win. If tied, it is broken by the player who controls a titled lord first in this order. King, Pope, Queen Regent, control of the most fiefs, bishoprics, and lastly, villages. If no one meets victory condition, another round begins with the first player marker going to the next clockwise player, until we have a winner. I can't wait to play this game again. Well, there's our first pro, replay value, and for many reasons. The one I like the most I would have to say is how the game is conducive to making new experiences based on the many different choices each player makes. The game allows you so many possibilities, 
yet guide you in this amazing story as the dice dictate outcome of disasters and battles. I know it's not a storytelling game, but it's incredible how well it does that through its theme and mechanics, because of its incredible detailed rules. I felt as though the game was a game master of a role playing session for a Game of Thrones campaign. Of course, with so many rules and information, however, the game does have a steep learning curve. It took us about three games to almost fully understand all the rules and intricacies. But I promise you, stick with it and it will reward you. Everything makes sense with the mechanics once you know them. Reminds me very much of Mage Knight, the board game in that aspect. Going back to the many choices players have, there are so many actions that affect so many players constantly that player interaction is huge. Alliances and power struggles are constantly shifting to keep you invested in the game at all times, even until the end. We didn't mention how these diplomacy markers can be used to allow two players to leave the table and discuss for three minutes should they choose to. What's also great is because each action is performed by each player as they happen as opposed to one player doing all of them, then the next and so on, the downtime is really low, even if there are some analysis paralysis moments. Speaking of time, the game is at least a couple of hours, but because it's so good we hardly felt it and time flew by. Now there is an element of luck that sometimes affects the players more than others, and I've seen this happen in several games where a bishopric was constantly being hit by disaster. But that just means that you'd have to ally yourself with another player for a shared victory. A half point penalty there. But with so many tactics like cavalcades and besieging someone into marrying you as a truce, yes, that happened in one of my games, I have to give a pro point for what I call creative tactics and strategies. And there were so many of them that these little surprises in gem brought such memorable moments of ingenuity that, as I stated before, just brought the game to life. All this with great artwork that has a stained glass look to it and good components to further that along, FIFA has offered me a gaming experience I haven't felt in a long time. It will make you feel and play as close as anything can to the experience of how the game of nobles to attain power really is. Marriages, truces, assassinations, manipulations, and every creative way in between all those options are done purely for one reason. Power and winning. Definitely not for everyone, but when you want a full immersive experience and not just a game, FIFA is for you. It should get 8.5 by our scoreboards, but with the pros feeling like they should be worth more, I'm giving FIFA a well-deserved 9 out of 10. Carl needs a vaping break. Are, are you kidding me, Luca? Oh, I need a vaping right. break. Like we need to review our contracts because he needs a vaping break. Pipe Piper. Pipe Piper. And then he has to do that. Like... You just fart or something? I just <laughs> vaped. <laughs> Which could be called... I just vaped. I'm sorry, I just vaped.